to Rapporteur's News. Oh, good evening and welcome to Rapporteur's News. It is Thursday evening, it's 7 o'clock and it's the 26th of May 2016. Uh, my name is Andy Young, and I'm joined, as always, by my co-host Jason Holmes. Good evening, Jason. How are you doing, mate? Good evening, Andy. I'm very well, thank you. And uh, I hope you and all our listeners and our guests are well tonight. But I think we've got a bit of unlimited time with him, so I think uh, perhaps the best idea is for you to uh, introduce our guests for this evening. That's right. Yeah, uh, someone we've been waiting, to, uh, trying to get onto the show for a long, long time. It's been quite difficult to make the connection. And we finally got hold of him about five minutes to seven. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome David Halpin to Raconteur's News. Good evening, David. Good evening, Andy. And uh, I understand uh, you won't be able to stay with us too long tonight because you no. had, had a bit of a problem with your dog going missing. That's right. I would like to stay with you for as long as you wish. But mm. um, I know that we should keep the phone free in case someone finds our little Jack Russell. Yeah, absolutely. We understand that, yeah. David. Um, before we, we were speaking off air, I mentioned that I was going to give a shout out to a sleep out for the homeless in Leeds that's coming up shortly. But I'll, I'll do that after you've had to go. Um, right. But you said that it's something that you'd like to talk about um, on that well, subject. Well, Andy, just to, to, to um, summarise my being, I'm 76. I'm a retired orthopaedic and trauma surgeon. Mm -hmm. And since I retired from a, what became a part-time job um, because of previous illness, mm -hmm. I've done some rather... I focused on what matters most. I took a ship um, to Palestine six weeks before Blair's war. Uh, it was partly for that reason I, we took the ship. It was a shout against the looming and um, the legal war on the people of Iraq. And we got to Ashdod. Uh, you can't go to Gaza. There's no port there, actually. But anyway, I've kept my contact, my contacts. We don't set up a charity. Charity is not the answer. Justice is the answer. And I've been to Gaza ten times. I also was the first person. I'm not saying this in any, in any bragging way, but I was worried about the way that Dr. Kelly passed on. And I thought about it. Eventually, I wrote a letter which went to the... Um, to the um, Morning Star, for which I wrote at the time, in fact, for quite a time afterwards. And the letter was published on the 16th of December, 2003, the year in which he was found uh, with um, cuts on his wrist on Harrodown Hill. And out of that came a tremendous amount of work. I was spent thousands and thousands of hours with some very good doctor colleagues and a, and a journalist colleague later on. So that was the second thing I got involved in, and I'm still involved with that. Because there's no question he was assassinated. Well, it is highly likely. You cannot say definitely. And, uh, but everything has been shut up. All avenues we explore are silent. And they've done a very good job of making sure that no one um, speaks. And the third thing, which I've been involved with really all my life, having worked in the health service since the age of 24, is the health service. And that is being dismantled. And I'm afraid what concerns me very much is that the population at large, who rely on the health service a lot, about 5 or 10% go off for private care, yeah. but uh, something which Bevan set up with great foresight and energy in 48 is being dismantled. And the summary, which your listeners would like to keep and use as a soundbite, if they write or if they're asked on interviews uh, to say something, is destabilize, demoralize, dismantle. And that's happening at a rapid pace. But people are distracted by charity runs in Lycra and cycling or the rest of it. And they cannot see that something that's so valuable and such good for the spirit of the country is being taken from, not taken from under their noses. Uh, and that, I've been writing about this for 12 years in the regional paper, but hardly ever has it been a letter of support. People are asleep. There's another thing, if I may go on a bit more, sure. that these people... They know what to do. The person to look at is Edward Bernays, who was a math psychologist yes. um, and um, PR man, really. He was Freud's nephew. There's an excellent, um, excellent one hour times four 
uh, documentaries about Bern Hayes by Adam Curtis on BBC. It's on um, YouTube now. Mm -hmm. But I'm quite certain, and this isn't paranoia, I'm quite certain that the people behind the politicians know exactly how to manage the people. And one thing that they're doing, which one of the techniques, one of the strategies, is to change everything suddenly. So it's fracking two days ago, being given a license by the um, North Yorkshire uh, Council, mm -hmm. and it's this and that, and it's the Brexit remain. So all the time, uh, people are always bemused by the rate of change. Yeah, it's information overload. It's information overload, and, and exactly. that uses the, the, the mind and, and people. It's, it's intentional. That's the point I'm making. Yeah, of course it's it is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll I'll now shut up. No, no, no. You can Sorry, I, I'm sorry to interrupt. No, no, you. Dude, I, no, no that, that's fine. What I got to say is this: actually, is that one of the the I've written, I spent thousands and thousands of hours with a very small group here in Ashburn in South Devon, um, trying to save the community hospital. It's an excellent hospital, 10 beds, and it's done sterling work over 150 years or something, a long time anyway. But they've also announced closure of three other hospitals. So Paynton, Dartmouth, Ashburton, and uh, Bobby Tracy. 60 beds in all. They say that they can manage this by, they can they can send people to their homes with a care, with a t care team to manage them at homes. Well, in many circumstances, or certainly in some circumstances, the people are too ill for that, and they need medical care in the hospital. Mm -hmm. And it's the only way they can get patients, or the main way they can get patients out of the big hospitals, DGH as we call them, the only way they can get them out quickly is into beds in these community hospitals. But they're ignoring that on the directions of, of uh, NHS England. But just as, this is addition to it. The other day on the BBC, which I have no time for at all, they um, support the status quo. They give you some facts which are useful, but it's no more than that. They conceal many others. To be blunt, it appeared it, they, uh, there was a, a segment about a few minutes on uh, the housing conditions in the southwest, and they probably picked the worst ones. Perhaps I don't know, but there were some with you know black fungus growing on the ceiling, you know, like mushrooms, uh -huh. um, uh, holes in the floorboards, all sorts of things actually. Uh, in, in not habitable, really. Anyway, they said that 230,000 homes in the Southwest were like this. 230,000. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I looked up the figures. The number of dwellings in the house in the, in the Southwest, rather symmetrically, is um, 2,300,000. So what it is, is 10% of the housing stock in the Southwest is, to put it bluntly, crummy or dangerous. Now, they're talking about sending some patients. In those houses, there will be some single elderly people. And there will be people, mostly people who are disadvantaged, they say, single mums who are struggling, people like that. Mm -hmm. But they're talking about sending people home. At least one in ten, probably more than that, would be going back to homes which are terrible. But they'd ignore all that, you see. They assume everyone has a, a boiler in the basement. A lot of those are broken, by the way, in these houses. But they're assuming that it's a nice middle-class setup with a thermostat set at 21 and a nice bathroom with uh, running hot water and the rest of it. But this is what they're doing. And um, what I have to say as a surgeon, but primarily as a doctor, is that we are quickly going back to pre-Victorian conditions. Some of the Victorian conditions actually were quite pretty good. The sewers work, things like that. Mm -hmm. So... But people don't grasp it, what is happening to our country. But all I can say as a doctor and surgeon who's worked in the health service for a long time is that if they dismantle it, which looks highly likely, unless there is massive public resistance, there will be the greatest distress in people, particularly poorer people. And of course, those who count for millions of people now, you know, on zero hours contract or the rest of it. Yeah, that, but that's really what I want to get They're getting poorer. We know that, don't we? We know yeah. that from the figures. Yeah. And um, you cannot, every time I, I open the machine, my sister, who's a wonderful investigator, who's been through the mill with um, uh, thyroid cancer, possibly caused by the, the uh, meltdown at Windscale in 1968, because a plume went, went east and 
southeast uh, and contained I-131, which is a dangerous isotope. Um, she sends me these things. But what's turned up tonight is that the people who are after the, um, what do they call it, the map, the, the land registry, not land registry, the uh, the mapping people, the, oh, the, the yeah. survey. Yeah. The, the people, the, there are four firms after that. They're going to privatize it. You'll flog it off, you know, the family of silver, as old Harold Mack yeah, called it. It's the four bidders are all offshore companies. So they will be getting no, uh, or very little, or none, no um, uh, tax income from those people. Do you see how obscene it is? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. I, I bet you absolutely think so too. I completely agree. And, and it's it's happening in, in all sorts of societies. And like you say, it is um, demoralise and uh, and then then you, you can destroy people. Yes. And, and this is uh, the best way to demoralise people, particularly when it comes to health, is when people are up against bureaucracy, which we see increasingly. I mean, I've been yes. in, um, in, the, in the healthcare system quite recently for a, for a heart condition. And sometimes some of the things that are, are asked of you and some of the things, the times where um, your, your appointments are just stopped, cancelled and you're not told and you turn up, um, you know, and they, it, it seems like that the more bureaucracy the more demoralised people become. Well, you know, Jason and Andy, uh, we had a wonderful orthopedic hospital in Exeter. It was called the Princess Elizabeth opened it. That was, that was its name. Forget that bit. 120 beds. There, were, there was a good cadre of skilled surgeons and wonderful nurses and physios there. It was world-renowned. We used to um, train people from Australia and Canada and elsewhere like that. Anyway, we fought to keep it open. They closed on, uh, I think, specious grounds, partly because it was so good. But we had an admissions officer there, Mary Gubar, to go into a little office. She had um, golf tees in, on a peg port. And she, I'd say, that lady's going to go home, that lady's going to go home, that children's going to go home, you can send to this patient, this patient. It was all done by with a pencil and paper and on telephone. <laughs> and um, the, the same in our clinics down in Torquay, the orthopedic clinics. A lady who became a friend, a very close friend of ours actually, was a clinic secretary, the senior one, and she just had, it was all done, had no computers, it was all done, as I say, with pen and, pa pen and paper, and she had the, because she was a local person, just think of this, she had the nurse, if someone died, she saw in the paper that there was a death notice, she used to look up the clinic and make sure that they didn't send another appointment to the widow or widower in case they should distress them. Do you see what I mean? Yes. Yeah. But that was the, this was the humanity of it. And it was done so simply. Now, now as you know, there are, there are computer screens all over the shop. It's not more efficient, I can tell you that. And when I had to, um, I wanted, I needed to see a neurologist who has none feet. And um, I wanted to go to a doctor in, in Plymouth. We'll leave that one alone, actually. But anyway, there was, Months or not, it wasn't anyway. Month after month, there was no connection. And eventually, I phoned the Royal Devon Next Hospital, which is where I used to work partly. And it was one of these speech recognition machines. I'm told it was old kit that they installed, but I tried it out. And on two out of seven, uh, out of five out of seven occasions, I was put through to the wrong department. It was, a, I think I asked for, I can't remember now, um, neurophysiology, something like that. Anyway, when I got through, eventually, to neurophysiology, or to another department, the man said it's disgusting. And you could hear the, the, the loss of morale in his voice. They were getting it, because people were being dis people were being taken off one job to answer the ruddy phone when it wasn't for that department. Because mm -hmm. some uh, wonk, some uh, accountant type, thought they could save money by having people answered automatically. Now, what I said in my complaint, it, it, go, it went nowhere. But supposing it was some old lady phoning about her husband who was terribly sick in the surgical ward. What? What? You need no imagination to know how she would be distressed, not to be able to get through quickly with a friendly um, uh, uh, telephonist on the other end. And this is what they've done. They've dehumanized it. And as you say... There's a, the bureaucracy has been made more complex 
um, so that um, people are defeated. They feel defeated, don't you? Yeah, yeah. You do. People, people do feel defeated. I mean, well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm. You feel belittled. You feel belittled too, actually. Uh, well, yeah. You, I, I mean, I'm, I'm quite young, so. <laughs> I'm quite, young. Resilient. I'm quite young. I'm 46, but um, yes. uh, I'm quite young, so I, I I can deal with it. But I, I can imagine for somebody perhaps who's on their own, just somebody who's maybe have just lost somebody or something who's on their own and doesn't know quite. I, I could see it being an absolutely daunting task. A daunting task. Or feeling very sick. Or feeling very sick. Mm-hmm. You know, people who've got um, disseminated cancer feel sick. Yeah. All sorts of people, um, all sorts of conditions make you feel sick. And you often haven't got the fight in you that you had when you were, um, were, were fit and vigorous. Um, no, the thing is that uh, there are, you know, there's wonderful humanity still in the system. But what I've said for years, about 20 years, is that the health service should not be in the hands of politicians. There should be a national executive, which there was actually, not, so, not necessarily a very good one. But that should be scrupulously um, uh, appointed. And that national executive is given the budget and gets on with it. And if they haven't got enough in the districts, too bad, they do their best. And that national executive reports to the House of Commons and to the Health Select Committee. Um, Health Select Committee. And uh, in this case, it would be our local Dr. Wollaston who would be um, receiving the first messages. But they would analyze what they had done. Uh, in the last six months, say, eh? what they could do better, what funds they might use to benefit patients. But the thing will be out of the hands of the Dan Camerons and Browns and Blairs and of any coalition wallows who are saying yes. And I've said that for 20 years, the people say, oh, it's a good idea, David. It's too simple. <laughs> and that's what they say. But I'm afraid that the politicians have it by the throat. That's the fact of it. They have it by the throat. And unless there is a revolution of the mind in this country, people people wake up. And what, they, what I said yesterday in an email, so many seem to be happy with serfdom, to being serfs. And I'm afraid that serfdom is coming. And I mean that. I'm sad to say it, but I mean it. Yeah. It does seem like it, we are on a slippery slope. It, it, it served them. We are we're virtually in it anyway. Um, we most are. Of people's income goes on basic, just basically surviving and living. Hand to mouth. Well, it, as you say, some are served now, no question. And they always were actually. When I in my job, I saw all sorts of all conditions of men and women, and I used to see people doing, you know, very humdrum, uh, hard manual manual jobs. They all worked out at 60, like pit ponies. Um, uh, and yet, of course, now they have to go on to 68 and for their pension, some of these people. But there we are. Now, I've spoken to you quite I, I mean, I do this quite a bit. I speak at people. Well, no, I'm speaking with you. You understand it, don't you? But um, w- I've always felt that using words with some passion allows um, other people to understand what is running through your mind and what is moving you. So um, so you will forgive me for, for being, um, I hope not verbose, but being um, an attack dog. <laughs> no, not at all, David. Um, we, yeah. we, we always realise that the subjects we cover um, and the guests that we have on, we cover some very hard-hitting, uh, sometimes quite dark subjects, do you? and they do make people passionate. So, yeah, it's um, good. Well, that's what we want. That's what we, we want expect. people to sit up, to know that uh, we live in a beautiful world. I use a little max, a little word that's maxim anyway. I say that to make people think about what we're doing with missiles and drones and all the rest of it abroad and with massive armies sometimes, that no mother and child should be in the least harmed anywhere in our still beautiful world. And I always add that to our beautiful world because people, we need to remind ourselves that we are very fortunate to live in the beautiful world and what we must be doing is enhancing it and not, um, and not either destroying any creatures, two-legged or four-legged, um, and doing everything to enhance. So I've done that. I've planted 6,000 trees and have 
bought three lovely woodlands. We bought cheap land, actually very cheap land. And I've been down there today. That's where we lost our dog. But um, so I love the natural world. And I I know not everyone in this country can get can, can get to it easily. I know that. I have millions really. But um, what I'm trying to say is that we need to um, we need to raise ourselves above the fray. We know what the fray is about, but we should aim higher. That's what I'm going to say. We should aim higher at, at you know you think of the education of children, which I don't know what it's like now, but I guess it isn't very good, and there are big classes and lots of children distracted and what. It's you. awful. Is it? It's absolute. I've got a stepson who's just doing his GCSEs, and it is awful. Well, I've imagined that. Of course, there are bright spots. Uh, we've got three girls, actually, all at school. Um, one can't get into nursing because you couldn't get her A level. You have to go to university now. Well, there are some wrinkles around there. But, um, see, that's, you see, Jason, that's. Where's Andy, by the way? Is he still there? Yeah, he's here. Is he? I'm um, still here. I'm just enchanted. When I think, enchanted, see, when I think Jason, of, um, I was at school, secondary school, from 1951 to 1958. It was a, a third boarding school, and it was a grant meant uh, you know, CV school in Chasby in North Dorset. And it really, really was. It wasn't any any great sparks, um, any great shakes uh, academically, although it was satisfactory. But the masters were good, decent men actually. Some were inspiring, and I never hear the word insp- inspiration in regard to education. All I hear is things like academies and all the rest of the rubbish. And um, uh, you know, you, I feel, I, I, some of the youngsters coming up, I can see from their faces that they're bright and hopeful and they'll do their best in the world. But um, I think it must be very difficult to keep your spirits up in some schools now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the yeah. the um, they're not helped. There's so much pressure around them as well, and there's so many different ways for them to to interact with each other. Um, yeah. And they, they seem to have been had um, a victim mentality installed in them. All kids, if you if you do anything, they'll they'll play the victim straight away. Um, th- this is something I've noticed from. Well, from my stepson and um, and, and from well, well, my daughter mean, as well, who's 19, who's, who's been through the school system. What do you mean so, by that, Jason? You give an example. Well, for for example, you if you if you if you if I should tell him that his room's a complete tip and it's been the tip for four days and he's got to clean it up, yes. he'll then start sulking and then his mum will say, well, "What's the matter with you?" And he'll say, well, "He's shouting at me." And uh, whereas I'm not, I'm talking just like. Like yeah. that, and then he tries to sort of flip things round. I mean, they, it 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 seems like that they they they're looking for people who have been bullied, um, particularly. I mean, bullying is is huge in schools. Um, what do you mean? Have, you mean the allegation? The allegation? You mean? What do you mean? Is that is is actual bullying? Well, I, I don't know. In some schools, I, I suppose there is bullying problems. But yes. what they what they do is they highlight and are you being bullied? And yes, so anybody can then, yes. well, the kids then interpret in different yes. ways what bullying is. Yes, you're, you're inducing it, really. Yes, I understand it. I understand. Well, where are you speaking from? Uh, I'm in Sheffield. Are you? And is there, is there a station in Sheffield? Uh, yeah, well, we're, it's, we're sort of, we're, um, Andy's in Boston, in Lincolnshire. Oh, I uh, see. Oh, my joke. So we're, right. we're, we're out there in the ether, really, David. Yes, I see. I bet. Oh, <laughs> Boston was on the um, the, the uh, BBC was speaking like yesterday, interviewing um, some of our, our friends from Europe. Oh yes, so, well we we had... so there's a massive amount of horticulture, there isn't there, and agriculture. That's right. We the the population of our town is since I think it was '92 when they started bringing Portuguese and Polish in, has increased sixfold. Where the infrastructure hasn't really increased at all. I think we built one extra school. Um, yeah. One of the doctor's surgeries has been extended a little bit, yeah. but the hospital's still the same size it was before. I think they may have built one new ward onto it, but it, it's just... Well, which called... hospital is that? Sorry? Which, which hospital, Andy? It's called Pilgrim Hospital. 
Is it a is that a district general hospital or is it a big community hospital? No, it's a it's a district general hospital, I think. Is it? Is it? Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Um, you know, it, it's very good to. How old are you, Andy? Me, I'm fifty. Um, fifty-two or fifty-three. I'm not sure. Are you? So you you're um, um <laughs> you're as they say, middle-aged, right? Yeah. Well, I'm but not you, expecting to live to be 110, but yeah, we can call you do, it. You do. Well, you tend to do. You. Well, I don't know whether I'll. Uh, I want to do things, but I think I might go on for quite a long time, actually. But um, I'm finding it quite difficult at the moment in this country. I would never leave the country, uh-huh. but um, and I'm hoping that the worms will turn, and that there there will be what I call a revolution of the mind, because that's what it needs. Um, I was just thinking on the way driving back from getting one of our dogs, my wife, uh, who I picked up at the station, I was thinking that uh, they're talking, they've highlighted the BBC, the 2.5 billion overspend. In fact, it's the underspend, really, because it's the, the, the cut back the 4% increase per year to 1%. So the 2.5 billion, billion um, overspend can be, can be understood. But I was thinking of that and thinking of the um, bailout of the banks, uh, which I know a bit about. You know, 540 billion of our money compared with 2.5 billion NHS overspend. And yet people are paralyzed by the media on the latter, on the overspend in the NHS. They forget all about the, the, the banks. A little thing here, actually, before I go off and. Um, leave the phone free for anyone phoning in for Stan. And that is this, actually, that... Um, do, you, do you know about leverage on the, the banks? Yeah. You know, well, do you know what leverage was at the time of the um, bank of the banking crisis? It was 3%. And Osborne, that crook, uh, was, um, a few months ago, uh, pleased to say that they'd increased leverage. He was very pleased with the improvement. and it, But it was still... Under four percent, and as you know what that means is that their their real assets only account compared with their loans only account for three to four percent, which means that the banks are as vulnerable now as they were in 1948, mm-hmm. in uh, 2008, and um, something else. You see, um, I've uh, I, what I wrote to that fellow Mac, I forget his first name there, huh? who's one of their economics correspondents. Oh yeah, and. Um, I wrote him and said, what about explaining to people fractional reserve banking? And you all wrote back, dear David, he said, good idea. I don't think he's got around to it. That was two years ago. You see, but so people don't know about that. Yeah, Yeah, all people get from the from the mainstream media, from from the BBC and ITN is some is some really complicated numbers uh, and people really can't make head nor tail of it. And, And They've got other things that, that that are on the mind that are that are taking up their energy. So, but so befuddle them. The ones that are conscientious will try and will sort of uh, bite on it and um, chew on it, and, but can't get very far. But you know, some simple facts like leverage would be of use for those people when they're considering about our own financial uh, sounders. Would it be all right, gents, if I now slope, leave the phone free for our Stan, who's fourteen years of age? It's very dear to us, but Ab- at the moment I'm cursing. Absolutely, right? David. It, it's a, I've been dying to talk to you for a couple of years now, and I'm just delighted that we've managed to hook up. I'll give you a call in the next few days and see if we can arrange a, t- a time. That's okay, well, I'd, I'd like that. And and the thing is that the only way we can, we, the only way we can get, well, the main way we can get on is by speaking to each other and informing them. Ben, I didn't have the greatest time for latterly, Edward Ben said, there is never a meeting in a village hall nowadays, and he's quite right. Yeah. Politicians don't like exposing themselves. So no one, they're relying on the BBC or the ITV and the paper, mostly useless. Uh, but the, the importance of communicating, like we're doing tonight, I don't have the listeners you have, I say good wishes to them. Um, and I'm very pleased to have spoken to you both. And I look forward perhaps to coming on your, your programme again. 
That would right. be brilliant. Uh, yeah, just, okay. just as a parting shot, um, we've got yes. quite a few messages for you from the chat room. Tony's oh. saying, good luck with finding your dog. And Mithrin says, <laughs> we are all Dr. Halpin. Oh, that's very nice. I like that very much. There's a, that's an echo of a very famous saying, actually. There. I can't remember who said it. Um, that's the trouble with my... I don't always remember uh, saying it very well, but... Um, thank you, Andy, and thank you, Jason. Thank you very much, David. It's okay. been a pleasure okay. to meet Bye-bye. you. Bye-bye. Um, we look forward to catching you again. Bye-bye. Oh, that was short and sweet, eh, hey, Jason? It certainly was, wasn't it? But uh, it, it certainly gave us something to chew over there. Yeah, he did, yeah. And, and, uh, do you know, I could have sat and talked to him for hours and hours. Well, that <laughs> I really the, could have done. That was the plan. If his little Jack Russell had, had done a runner, I'm sure uh, he'd have been up for it. Well, it, I think I'd run off as well if somebody called me Stan. <laughs> was that what he's called his dog? I didn't hear that. <laughs> yeah, that was, oh, that's the dog that's missing, his Stan. Oh, well, that's as good a name as any for a dog, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, OK. It's, yeah, I suppose it is. But um, I, I was hoping to um, to have a bit of a conversation with David about, about the... Um, the mission that he went out to Gaza and he took um, a shipload of food there, mostly at his own expense. I believe he, he spent £95,000 of his own money. He actually sold his house to do it. And uh, he chartered a, a Danish ship and a crew. And uh, a few of them went over there to... They landed at Ashdod and then in Israel and went into Gaza. And they delivered to the food to people personally, and they met the people who were receiving that aid. And um, I, I just thought it was quite inspirational the way he did it, because a lot of people would have said, "Well, let's let's get a container, fill the container, and send that over there." But then, yeah. when you do that, you're never quite sure where what black hole it's going to disappear down, because we we know. Um, from reports from people like David, from Eva Bartlett and stuff like that, that the aid often never reaches the people it's supposed to. It's it's, um, it's stolen by the governments and various militias. So I thought that was good. And also, um, Dr. Kelly, yeah, Mithrin's just said, I want to know about Kelly. Um, there is quite a lot of information on David's website about uh, Dr. Kelly, including uh, the there is his death certificate on there. I've been reading through the uh, review of the coroner's report today, and that makes interesting reading as well. Oh, you know, good. You know, yeah. the, the, just small things like the, the coroner actually arrived on scene at midday and didn't take a body temperature until 19.15 in the evening. Well, that strikes me as being a bit remiss and... It's clearly... Yeah, it does me as well. I mean, it, you would have thought that would be the first thing that he would have done, you know. So one, one of the first things that, you know, we've checked. Obviously, if he's dead, you've mm. got to find out how, how long he's been dead. That's one of the first things, isn't it? Well, that's it. you can it. start your investigation. Yeah, he, he arrived at midday. The, the scientific team didn't arrive till 2 p.m. So all he did was ascertain that, that Dr. Kelly was dead and just stood back for two hours, didn't do anything else at all, um, and then let the scientific team do their bit. But um, I understand um, in cases like that, they use a, a rectal thermometer, but he's, um, the guy who was conducting the review of the procedures said that, well, you know, the last thing you'd do after he was investigating that would take the clothes off the body, so he wouldn't be able to do the... Um, the rectal thermometer till uh, till everybody else had finished what they were doing, but I would have thought in such an important case that was being treated as a, a suspected murder, that's one of the first things you would have done. Well, bearing in mind what he'd been involved in, Dr David Kelly, and the evidence he'd given just a few days before, I believe, he died, um, then you would have thought that they would have been... Let's just let's, let's face it, if they'd have found Tony Blair dead in the field in the same circumstances... I think there would have been a, a you know a, a different investigation altogether. Mm. It just don't it just doesn't seem to add up. That, you know it, it seems to have been a shoddy investigation, and this is time and time again we find in these false flag 
incidents like 7-7. It's all shoddy. It's all badly put together. You know, the cover story is terrible. Yeah. The photographs, you know, and the, well, all the evidence is just so badly put together. But people mm. just don't seem to get it. And I don't know whether just people just don't want to get it. I don't, you know, it's like you don't want to admit the monster in, in your wardrobe. No, well, if you if you close your eyes and pretend it's not there, you might be able to go to sleep. But if if you kind of open your eyes and open the wardrobe doors and face the monster, um, you know, it, it all becomes very real, doesn't it? And I, I think that's some of where people's problem is. <laughs> Keno says, Tony Blair, dead in a field. Now there's a thought. <laughs> yes, we can yeah, I mean, I think that's probably a fantasy that is Ken, and there's a lot of people share that fantasy. I know. Um, not that I wish any ill will on Mr. Blair, but you know, if he wants to go into a field and commit suicide, then you know, I can't, I can't stop him from doing that. No, absolutely not. And, and I think I'd probably get beaten up for stopping him doing that. Well, uh, I was going to say, if he needed any help, um, we'd be more than willing to, to help him, surely. Yes, yes, it would. Yeah, it, it is um, a great shame David couldn't stop a, a little bit longer, but obviously Stan is more important. He's 14, like I said, 14-year-old dog, so he's had him a long time. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so uh, you can. it's understandable that they want to keep the phone free, and uh, I, I'm thankful for the half an hour that we got out of him uh, because... Um, he certainly is a man that's got plenty to say, and uh, I don't think I don't think I could have I don't think I would have got bored if <laughs> could have carried on all night. I think. No, when when he said, "Oh, is Andy still there?" I thought, "Well, I'll just, I'll just be keeping quiet because I love listening to the guy." That, yeah, that's right. Yeah, and it, you sort of he, he's a bit humble as he, well, he's a really humble guy, you know, and he he thinks that if he's been talking for too long, that, that people are going to get sick of him. But you know we. I was sort of like wanting to say, we've only got you for half an hour, so you know we want to hear you talk. I can talk all I want after you've gone. Yeah, of course. So, uh, yeah, but, yeah, great. We're going to have to get him back. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'll phone David in the next couple of days. I'll give him a bit of time to get sorted out with his dog. And uh, it just, just reminded me of some of the people that it would be uh, good to get back on as well. Um, along the lines of some of, uh, what David was talking about there, um, it just reminded me about getting Barry Trower on. I think it would be nice if we could get Barry on because I think his information is very important to uh, drum home to people. And um, I've seen somebody's just arrived in the chat room and that's Toddy. Now, Toddy did give me a little list. He wanted me to do a shout out, but um, I know Toddy's been out and doing stuff, so he's probably not got organised when he, he's got back in. But, um, Toddy, if you'd like to call in and uh, we can have a little bit of a chat about what's coming up, that would be uh, a, a useful way of um, using up the rest of the two hours. What do you say, Jason? Well, I, I, I mean, that's a great idea. If Toddy's there and he's got the means to uh, give us a call and uh, come on and tell us what he's been doing. I've been seeing um, his posts on Facebook. And he's doing some great work um, and helping people. That, that's the best thing. Is seeing people help other people. That's just it's it, it makes you feel uh, it makes you feel it makes you feel warm inside. I had a, a just for an example. I had um, uh, some a girl that I used to know. Mm -hmm. Now nothing ever romantic. Just somebody I used to know from school, and we we hooked up on Facebook and she saw some of the things I was posting and then she got back in touch. She got in touch with me and she was said she were really interested in the Madeleine McCann stuff and all that. Mm -hmm. And then I started talking about um, depression and things like that. Um, and she confided in me mm -hmm. um, that she'd, uh, that she suffered from depression. She was bipolar. And, and so I just chatted to her for some time. I told her how to, protect your subconscious mind and to stop let don't let this this stuff in if you don't let it in if you can protect your subconscious mind that's the stuff that you don't know that's going in mm -hmm. but if you can protect that and I, I sort of get her some work on that and I said to her I said you really want to try and get off your medication and then I got ill 
and so I've not really spoke to her for six months. And I got I just got a message just the other day um, from her that said, um, I just wanted to let you know I've been off my meds now for three months. I feel um, as as best I've felt in years. Um, and I just wanted to say thanks for your help because you helped me. And I said, well, you've done it yourself. But, you know, it's always nice to get some thanks from somebody. But, yeah, they, it's just things like that, little things. Um, that, uh, that 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 I got that on the same day that we got that um, comment on the Tony Farrell interview um, from from that uh, family member of a survivor of, of somebody who died at Hillsborough. Yeah. Um, so I got those two messages right at the same time. So it was like two um, really feel good messages, and and you can't you can't buy that feeling. You can't you, you helping people the feeling that you get. No matter what it is, just the smallest thing, it, it beats anything that you could do running around a field and getting muddy. Yeah. Uh, I've just seen Toddy's available. Shall we see if we can get him in on the call? Yeah, get him on. Right. Uh, how do we do this? Right. Add people to call. There we go. Um, what's his name? Oh, he's just upgraded Skype, he says. Oh, was he? Yeah. Well, that I mean, it'll probably not work then. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we'll give it a try, see if we can get Toddy in. I know, he says uh, two minutes. He's just put pop that in chat room, two minutes. They'll be on in two minutes. Ah, right. Yeah, no worries. Oh, oh, here he is. Hello. Good evening, mate. How are you doing? Uh, yeah, I'm absolutely fine. Are you? Yeah, I haven't spoke to you in ages, mate. How are you doing? Uh, I'm, uh, I'm half all right. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, it was a bit of a joke there. We actually did have a conversation uh, a couple of hours ago, didn't we? Um, yeah, we did indeed, mate. Yeah, I'd give you a quick buzz and you answered as per usual and said, well, oh, my God, what do you want? <laughs> yeah, um, but yeah, sorted, yeah. Uh, I've got a little bit of background kicking back here because I can sort of like hear it repeating. Um, I think the Skype that it's saying here, do you want to allow the following program to make changes to the computer? So if you could give me about a couple of minutes, wait for me to pop up, and then it'll have done the update, yeah, and no then we'll get cut, cut off. Yeah, no problem, Toddy. All right, so give us a couple of minutes. Let me just update, and then and then I'll just I'll come back in chat room and say, right, buzz me. Okay, no worries. All right, me. cheers, guys. Okay. Cheers, Toddy. Ta-da. All right, cheers, Jay. So... Toddy's going to quickly update Skype. That could be half an hour job, but we'll get there in the end. No worries. Oh, <laughs> Ken wants us to give him a kiss from me. Hmm. Uh, well, Andy, Jason, I think that might be your job, Jason. Well, I, I would think I'm closer. He's in Leeds, isn't it? Yeah. Well, it, yeah. I think Ken knows how Skype works, doesn't it? I, yeah. Well, I don't know. Does he? <laughs> well, he has got a Mac, you know. That you can excuse these things. The Mac user, ah, oh, the Mac user. It's like the BMW driver and the vegan. I, I notice people that seem to be hating on vegans. I don't know why, but they just seem to be hating on them. Well, I, I don't particularly hate on anybody. What what really gets my goat is the people that that um, they suddenly they meet someone or they hook up with someone or they have a change in their life and. The, they decide they're going to change their whole way of life and they're going to become a vegan or a non-smoker or a non-drinker or all of the above. And then suddenly, within weeks, they start telling the rest of the world that they're completely evil for doing what they've done for the rest of their bloody lives. Yeah. And, and I just think, get off your high horse, will you? Well, that's me. I mean, now I think that... And I think this is backed up by scientific evidence. I think that anybody that lays flat in bed is evil. <laughs> well, not evil, just not not educated, man. No, no, they're they're pure evil. <laughs> they're trying to t- trick us all into laying flat. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it quite astounded me when um, Andrew came out with the uh, the detail that if you confined to a flat bed for a long enough period of time you'll start to exhibit exhibit symptoms of AIDS now I'm not suggesting and I don't think Andrew is that that's where AIDS comes from 
But the fact that when you get AIDS victims, you raise their, bed, raise their bed and they suddenly go from death's door to walking about, leading a normal life. Suddenly they haven't got glaucoma anymore. Suddenly they're uh, eating well. There's got to be something in there, isn't there? Do you know what? I don't care whether there is or there isn't. It's working for me, so. Yeah, that's it. Um, I, 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 I have become a bit of a ball. I, I do tell everybody and my mum. Um, I, I, I told you I fell out with my mum. I, I spoke to her last night and uh, I told her about it. And she's getting some for her bed races. Oh, excellent! Yeah. So, but, I, uh, yeah. <laughs> I suppose that's the kind of making up gift to your mum, isn't it? Yeah, I don't know if I'm going to live to regret it, but yeah. So. Uh, <laughs> well, it, it's, if she has bad effects from it, she'll be the first person that I've come across. So. Yeah. Um, you know, to me, anything you can do to improve your health without chucking bucket loads of drugs down your throat, pharmaceutical drugs, is it, it's got to be a bonus. And, um, you know, whereas most lifestyle changes cost you a fortune, or it'll certainly you have to alter the way you spend, with this one, um, you can do it for the price of a couple of bricks or a bit of timber. Yeah, yeah, of course you can. I know, I know for the first eight months or so we did it, we just got bits of timber wedged in there and then I bought some of those bed razors so they'd be a bit more stable, like. Yeah, and uh, the the bed razors I've got is the... the oh, it's saying not long now, according to Toddy. Um, <laughs> yeah, it does that, Toddy. Don't worry, mate. It'll be ages. <laughs> um, what were we talking about? Bed razors. Bed razors, yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. It's just a few quid. It don't cost all. Just you might as well try it. Mm. Um, get it some time though. Don't just try it one night and then think, oh, that were a bit weird. I felt like I was asleep on a slide. <laughs> uh, you know, you just um, get get it some time and the 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 the, uh, went, the benefits will come. You went straight up to the six inch slope, did you? Yes, I went straight. Well. I think it's about six inch. Yeah, I couldn't really, I didn't really measure it, but yeah, I think it's about six inch. Well, we we started with because Andrew said some people might find it a bit weird sleeping at six inch slope for for the first few nights, but he said if you're at all worried about it, and kind of we didn't, neither of us slept that well. Um, we were both in a lot of pain, so we thought, oh, we'll just go three inches for a start, which is what he suggested, and we had three inches. I think it was for a week. And to be quite honest, at three inches, you couldn't notice the difference. The only way you could tell was if you went in the the bedroom in daylight and saw that the um, headboard was leaning away from the wall. But to actually sleep in the bed at three-inch tilt, you couldn't notice any difference at all. Then when it went up to six inches, it was the kind of same amount of steps, so you really didn't notice it. So yeah. if anybody's a bit concerned and they, they put it up six inches and think, whoa, that's a bit steep, that feels a bit weird, just try it three inches for a week or two, and then put it up to the full six inches and uh, no problem. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, Patrick's put in the chat room, uh, what, no foreplay, Jason, just straight in, hey? Yes, that's right, the full six inch straight away. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. And uh, somebody's put, uh, Mithrin's put, how long did the achy legs thing last? Well, my legs, um, I think, I think it just takes a little bit of time to get used to it, doesn't it? Because you get more, you get more blood pumped around them, so, mm -hmm. because of, because of, because of gravity. And um, what I wanted to uh, just bring up quickly, yeah. what do you think of um, that now um, legal highs are illegal? So, the legal high. Can you see how they're trying to confuse people? Yeah. They're still using the term legal highs, and that legislation is so, so wide ranging. It, it's anything that can alter a state of mind. So I would imagine that would include tea, coffee, know, their their drugs, anything that they do. Yeah. So so anything that that alters your um, psychological state. Hmm. So exercise, that could be classed as an illegal high, couldn't it? Yeah. In fact, uh, the, the raised bed could be a legal high because <laughs> you are higher. 
So you reckon they'll be coming round measuring the legs of the beds? Making sure that you're not on inclined beds. See, it's all a conspiracy. They're trying to keep people flat, laid flat, so that they get AIDS. Anyway, I think Toddy's ready, he says. Let's see if we can add him back in then. Here we go. Uh, then people do this call, Toddy. There we go. There he is. <coughs> Excuse me. Are you back with us, Toddy? I might be. Ah, that's it. Here he is. He's the main man. Yes, um, we've been uh, having a look at yours and Lou Mag's Facebook page lately, and you both do. Have you been? You've been stalking. Oh yeah, I've been stalking you, mate. We've nice uh, been having a look, and you and your your little clan, you're doing some amazing uh, work out there. But uh, I understand you got a um, little bit of an altercation with the boys in blue yesterday. Well, uh, yeah, we had the inspector turn up. I asked him where he's fucking, he parts his boat like, but he couldn't answer that question. <laughs> so, I says, where's your ship? He went, you what? I went, where's your ship? He went, I ain't got a ship. I went, all right, that's all I need to know. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> but anyway, yeah, that, I thought half of them, they, they ain't got a clue. I mean, end of day, they joined the police force, yeah, they will come up the ranks and then... That I think they strategically picked through their mannerisms and the way that they work and stuff to be put into them positions, you know, like inspector and stuff like that. It doesn't happen by chance, I don't think. No, I no. think it's down to who, who plays the arse licking game the best. Well, no, I think it's more to do with the, 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 who they can control the most rather than, than that. But yeah, maybe a little bit of arse licking goes a long way as well in that satellite to get into that climb to that position right up the fucking trouser leg like. Oh, oh bless you. Yeah. Well, anyway, can I just say, um, we talk about the legal eyes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. We is, is, is everybody aware about what, what's going on on the street a lot of the time with within the uh, sort of like you know um, the hostels, the homeless? Uh, they're not just doing the drink and the drugs and stuff like that. There's a lot of them going on the old spice, is what it's called. Mm-hmm. And that's not the shit where somebody gets on a surfboard and, you know, flies through a fucking wave. Not that old Spice, <laughs> but Spice, the drug. Yeah, yeah. Um, is everybody aware that a lot of people used to do something called ketamine, which is a horse tranquilizer? Yeah, yeah. Right, well, okay, well, what Spice is, Spice is a tranquilizer for fucking sharks and whales. You joking, Joe? I'm, I'm not. It's, what they do is they give them spy, uh, the, 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 the tranquilizer. If they're wanting to ship a, a killer whale from one sea place to another sea world or whatever, the, what they do is they, they, they inject them with this tranquilizer, which then holds them still in transit. Because if you're, if you're pelting it down motorway on a big HGV that's devised to, to transport whales and, and sharks and stuff, um, you don't want them flapping about because it just take the whole HGV clean out and probably take half of the motorway out with it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, of course. So Spice is basically the tranquilizer that they use to shut the server, uh, central nervous system down. And what, what, what happens then is obviously these people are being given this Spice, not in a whale dose, of course, but that's where they start frothing at the mouth and start shaking and stuff because it's the central nervous system that's, that's shutting down. So that's 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 the new thing. So they've gone from horses, they've gone straight into the sea, and they want to do what sharks and whales get off the tits with. That's bonkers. <laughs> so that's uh, yeah, that's that's going on in, in within the hostels and homeless, with homeless and that sort yeah. of thing. Is it being peddled around? Oh, massive, yeah, on, on, on a big scale. We we can smell it. We can smell it on a night. Um, more on a more on a Monday night. I don't know why that is, but uh, there's there's not just real chain street kitchens. We've got city square uh, on on a Sunday night. So we 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 get our stall set up between our five and six, and then start serving at about half past six. But we also help in conjunction with a, a group called Leeds Homeless Partnership. Uh, and Leeds Homeless Partnership have been doing it since round about just well just after Christmas on a Monday. And it's more Mondays that we, we seem to be, you know, getting this spice about and stuff. And you can actually smell it. You can smell the spice. That's why they call it spice. 
Right. Oh, right. Well, I have a um, conversation about this with a, a friend of mine who, who works as a prison officer, actually. And um, he's he's quite an active person. Um, well, you probably all know his name if I said it, but I'd rather not because I don't think he particularly wants it known what he does for a living or to make a crust. Um, but um, this guy was saying that... Um, it's very difficult to know when the prison officers are going to finish a shift now because this spice is so ripe in jails that uh, what happens is quite often it, when they think they're just about due to clock off and go home, um, they suddenly get a prisoner escort to take a prisoner to jail that has uh, become unconscious and is in a right state because of this spice. And um, they, instead of you know, maybe knocking off the shift at six or seven o'clock in the evening, they can often be there till one in the morning at the hospital and they're, they're kind of out of the loop. They're not allowed to contact anybody while they're doing it. And uh, it, it makes arranging things an absolute nightmare. So, oh, it, I, yeah, I can, I can see that. So, I mean, we, 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 where there is people going missing and that, you know, that might be exactly what you've just hit on there. It's <laughs> happening that the police are picking them up, the spice out of the red, and then what they're doing is they're shipping them straight into the prisons by the sounds of it. Right, well, right. I don't know. I, and I, I, All I was thinking was it, it was perhaps the latest drug of choice in prison, because I know, um, I mean, probably the best drug to give somebody in, in jail is cannabis, because they're going to be pretty uh, docile, aren't they, most of the time. Um, oh. but, but because they, they're randomly tested and cannabis stays in your system for kind of 30 days or so, then they can't use that. So what a lot of them are using is uh, anything that gets out of your system quite quick. And I know that's why heroin is preferred in, in jail in, in preference to cannabis because it gets out of your system quicker. You've less likely chance of getting a charge for using it. Well, yeah, because you get charged, they come up with all sorts of stuff to extend your stay in prison, don't they? You know, because obviously it's big money. Yeah. Um, you know, because it's in the, pretty much in the private sector. Um, but yeah, the, the spice is massive in the prisons now. Uh, so it's obviously, it's in the prisons, it's out on the street. It's, it's, it's the drug that's being peddled freely. Um, you touched on something about, you know, the legal highs of coming to a, in, in a force basically from midnight last night into today. And it's just ironic that, you know, nine people are, are, are in Rochdale, I think. Yeah, Rochdale, yeah. yeah. For, uh, uh, have all fallen ill just before the legal high. So obviously they've been spiked, haven't they? Some, somebody from some government agent body has come in and made sure they've got a bad dose on the street. Well, I, I was um, listening this morning to Five Live uh, while I was driving. So it was just what's on. I can't stand listening to music, so I listen to talk. And it was... Must have been adverts on TalkSport or something, so I got Five Live on. And they got a discussion about um, these legal highs. Now, BBC is supposed to be impartial and balanced. That's the, the main thing. Yeah, yeah, right. And they got... Uh, so I sent a text in um, saying... I did, They didn't read it out, but I sent a text in saying, um, you're supposed to be impartial and balanced, yet you've got somebody on who's... Uh, son died after taking a legal high, but you haven't got somebody on who had a really good time when they took a legal high, because that would be balanced. You know, it's it all just seems to be all in, in you know, the, the, there are a lot of people that advocate the legalisation of drugs, because then they, they could be regulated, and people know what they're taking. Um, and, and really, you can't really tell somebody what they can put in the body, I don't think, anyway. Um, so, they, they don't really, have, all they do is they, they put the parents on there, the grieving parents whose children um, have have died uh, after taking these legal eyes. Well, a lot, a, lot, a lot of these legal eyes and stuff at the end of the day, you know, um, if we look at the, 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 the human being as a whole, we're all different. So you've got people out there that'll eat peanuts and it'll fucking kill them instantly, do you know what I mean? Yeah. So the legal highs are pretty much similar to that. So somebody that's never had a legal high before takes a legal high or an E 
and they're the ones that drop dead because their body can't cope with them chemicals that are going into their system, in, in, in theory. Um, but then, yes, it's very, what you're saying there, it's very one-sided, so there's no impartiality, there's no sort of like for and against. It's all heavy, heavy to one side, isn't it? So it's all negative, 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 negative. Yeah. To then push out this new legislation, so that's why they're doing it. And a lot of people, as you well know, like you just said, you don't listen to the music, you put on the radio, which is five live and what have you. So that's the kind of programming that's going to be coming down the radio waves within your car, or if you're at home listening to it. If you're at home, you're probably going to be on BBC, and they'll be heavily weighted against it as well. So it's uh, you know it's pretty much the, the, there's not going to be an, an impartial view. Or yeah, I took it and it. Absolutely fantastic, and I photosynthesized at the same time. We plant for a lot of it. Well, we're halfway through the show, Toddy, and I'm just wondering if you've got a set of headphones you could perhaps connect to because we seem to get a little bit of feedback through your speakers. Uh, um, while we sort that out, uh, we normally have a tune at half time, so. Uh, Pleased to announce that on Raconteur's News tonight, we have got the world's first airplay, well, apart from when I played it last night, when I was just playing a few tunes on air, of the new single from Bedrock, a.k.a. Ken and Susie, out in Spain, and it's called Let's Work Together. We'll be back in about four and a half minutes. <laughs> woo
your number one radio station. Tune in and rip the knob off. It's uh, not getting to so I can't do it, um, Andy, sorry. No worries, mate. And thanks for that um, gravelly-voiced uh, re-intro there, Toddy. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> and, well, it's been quite an eventful evening. Uh, first, we had a bit of a panic because we couldn't get hold of David Halpin because he couldn't sort his Skype out. Then we managed to get hold of him. Uh, I managed to find him in the phone book, actually. Uh, called him on his home number. And uh, then we found out that um, the extra spooks that uh, Scummer and paid for have been out and stole his dog, so he couldn't talk to us. So I uh, hope you get your dog back soon, David, and uh, we'd love to speak to you again soon. But in the meantime, it just so happened that just before the show, I got Toddy called me up and asked me if I could give a shout out tonight. So what better way to do it than get Toddy on himself and let him do the shout out. Okay, okay. Right. Uh, where are we? Right. Street Kitchens. Um, we, we're, 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 we're working alongside a group called Leeds Homeless Partnership. Yeah, they've been, uh, they've set their stalls out since around about Christmas time. Ironically, mm-hmm. Hayden mm-hmm. Pat. Uh, the lad who's the main lad there uh, grew up on the same estate as me and Jason. Yeah, so it's we've ended up connecting together years down the line, and he's doing obviously something very very similar now. What what they're doing is they're doing a um, a sleep out in Hyde Park, uh, which is just up from Leeds University. That's uh, this coming or not this coming Saturday, Saturday the fourth. Uh, I spot. Probably we've raised them 500 quid so far from real change of sponsorship, and obviously them guys have been doing the spot putting that out there, uh, and and the whole thing is basically to give people an idea of what it's like to sleep on the you know out in in the open um, just on one night only. So that's coming up on the fourth, and that's up in Hyde Park in Leeds. Um, so hopefully it's got a lot of it is going to be filmed. So then there's going to be a film developed. And then that's going to be put out there just to show, obviously, the experience that we've experienced with people that are homeless. And we're going to share the evening together. So that's going to be quite good. Uh, and that's coming up. But Hayden and his group, uh, Leeds Homeless Partnership, they, they do an absolutely fantastic job. I mean, the amount of things that they they put together, the hot meals, uh, sleeping bags, um, tents, socks. Socks is a big thing. Because a lot of these people that are out in, in, in all elements, once their shoes and, and socks get wet, that's it. You know, they need clean socks all the time. So that's a one, one big thing that we're obviously pushing is for people to start donating as many pairs of socks as they possibly can, you know. Uh, but that, like I said, that's coming up um, on the 4th of June. So that's going to be quite exciting. Like I said, we're going to put a little film together about it as well so people can, who, ha, who can't come can actually experience and, and, and watch it if they, if, if, if they see fit and it's something that they're interested in. Now, we put it to a lot of people that everybody are three paychecks away from being homeless themselves. And the more people I speak to about this, the more people it sort of like resonates straight away and they're like, bloody hell, I'm glad you've just said that. I, um, I was speaking before I come on the show and I was speaking to a chap called Darren Mitchell. Mm-hmm. And he asked me why we got involved in this with the you know the homeless situation and the, the, the less fortunate. And I says, purely and simply, I'd like to know that there's somebody out there, if I was in that position, that put their hand out to me and feed me. And he's like, oh, that's that's such a good answer. He says, because he says, I agree with what you're saying. Everybody is three three paychecks away from being homeless. Um, I don't know if you guys want to jump in on that, and if you sort of like agree with what I've just said there. No, oh, absolutely. I mean, anybody's... Only getting ill or uh, losing the job, that, that, that's all it takes. You're not very far away, and the people that look down the noses at people that, uh, that have fallen on hard times, they're the ones that are going to feel it the most. They're going to feel it the worst. Well, th- th- this is, I mean, there's, there's more to come. I mean, I've heard on the grapevine that um, the councils across the country, uh, I don't know if this is true, so therefore it's speculation at the minute, guys. I've heard that they're going to bring the rental the rental lines up to the, in line with private landlords. So three bedroom house currently in Leeds is round about five fifty to six fifty a month, depending in which area. Mm-hmm. At the minute, a three bedroom property Leeds City Council are taking I think it's eighty two quid a week, which works at three hundred and sixty quid a month. Now, if that is the scenario. 
if you're on benefits, I don't think your benefits are going to cover you, which means then at the end of the day, you've got to pay out of your housing benefit will cover so much, then out of your, your income, which is the benefit that's given, you're probably going to have to top your rent up, which is then going to put people in a position where they can't eat, they can't have electric, they can't have gas. Um, it's going to be a position where family members will probably have to scrap their council house and all move in together. Now, yeah, like, they, sorry, go on, Jay. I, I will just, sorry, I think Andy wanted to ask a question. No, sorry. Go ahead, Jason. Oh, right, I was just going to say, you know why you're talking about um, that people, once they've uh, the housing benefit's not going to cover these rents, they're going to have to start paying out of the benefits. And these benefits are what, when, they, when, when you get benefits, it says this is what the law says you need to live on. That's correct. Uh, yet you, you're not, you can't even have that much to live on because you've got to pay your rent with that. Well, that, that's it. And if you're already in debt as well, what happens is whether you're on ESA, JSA, whatever it is, if you're in debt and there's uh, somebody out there that wants to retrieve money from you that they're saying they're coming with a claim and they're saying that you've not paid us money for Yorkshire Water or there's a fine in place from Leeds Magistrates or whatever Magistrates Courts uh, commandeers your area. They have what they call it, Leeds City Council, uh, Council Tax Arrears. They have what they call um, a credit license. And because they're in possession of a credit license, that means that they can approach your benefit and say, this, 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 this individual owes us so much money. And what happens is they put in a claim. The benefit service then turn around and go, right, yeah, not a problem. And they take what... Leeds City Council for the council tax or Yorkshire Water or Leeds Magistrates or whoever are saying for granted and what they do is they write to you and make you aware that they're going to deduct £5 a week and pay it to the creditor because you are automatically classed as a debtor. So that they're allowed to take up to 30% out of that benefit that you are in a position like you're saying Jay is the law states that you, you live off. They can take 30% of that and pay it to uh, creditors like Yorkshire Water in Leeds, like Leeds City Council for council tax, like the magistrate if you've got a fine, and so on and so forth. As long as the, the, the creditor comes in, they've got a credit license, which they will have because they're a creditor, uh, they can come in and, and, and bypass you if they're not getting any anywhere with you and you're saying, I'm not paying you. They'll just go straight to um, the benefit agency. And what's happening there is the benefit agency are actually acting like a bailiff. Jeez. Yeah, I, yeah, I did come across that because um, in my dark and murky past, I worked for my local council, which is East Lindsay, and um, or oh, it was at the time; it's not anymore. And I, because I of the job that I did, I worked within the debt recovery department. Now I know for a fact that the East Lindsay Council have got their own. Well, they're called certified bailiffs, but I would question whether they actually are or not. Um, but they they used to do something called an attachment of earnings or attachment of benefit. I mean, this is going back to when council tax had only just started when I started working there. I was only there for a couple of years. Um, I actually really loved the job I was doing because I could actually help people. Um, but unfortunately, I got offered twice as much money to go back lorry driving and I couldn't live on what the council were paying me. So uh, that, that relationship didn't last very long. Um, but yeah, th it's been going on a while, Toddy, and it, it is bloody shameful. I, that's what I've never been able to get over. When I've been out of work, uh, you know, you get letters saying this is the minimum amount the law says you need to live on. And then they start taking chunks out of it. You know, where do they get off when that? Because they will probably look at it in the way that they're not there to subsidise these things that we need, i.e. water and uh, council tax and so on and so forth. So in that benefit that you're given, I, I, somebody said to me that some of the benefit money you are allowed to use for pleasure. And that's actually wrapped into the amount of benefit that you get. So therefore, that pleasure is within that 30%. So they will take out of that thirty percent to reduce your pleasure, so to speak. Well, I know, I know a lot of people who are on income support, 
and there is no pleasure in their life. You know, they they just live from day to day. They live from hand to mouth. There is no money for for luxuries. You know, they they well, do well to buy clothes from charity shop. Never mind anything else. Well, absolutely. I mean, we see that. I mean, and you, you, on the money that people get. I mean, let's look, let's look at it from this perspective. If you're in uh, a situation like these guys that we're dealing with, there's a lot of people that come to feed uh, on a Sunday night when we've got our kitchen up and running, and they're in a position where they're in a hostel. If they're in a hostel, the hostel are charging for argument's sake 250 quid a week rent for the bed. The housing benefit covers 200 quid. That means there's obviously at the end of the day 50 quid sat there waiting to be paid. That will then automatically come out of the benefit claimant that's using that bed. It will come out of their money. Um, they have to pay £100 out of that benefit. So they're getting paid fortnightly, 140 quid a fortnight for argument's sake. If they're in a position where there's creditors coming in and taking money, sometimes when they've paid that £100 out of the fortnightly benefit, which is 50 quid per week for that room, on top which, like I'm saying, is the room's 250 quid, they'll only, they'll only get 200 quid uh, housing benefit, they've got a 50 quid shortfall. If they're getting 140 quid a fortnight, like I'm saying, a hundred pound of that benefit has got to go straight to their bed, left 40 quid, what can they do with the 40 quid? If they're in a position where they're in debt, which a lot of these people probably will be, they might be left with, what, a tenner a week? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. To live off. Yeah. So the, the, they're pushed in a position where at the end of the day, they've pushed that far down. They, they, they can't get anywhere. It's They're pushed into an impossible position yet where, where they can't get anywhere. But then what happens is they're then pushed down a direction where they can go get their own flat. Once they get their own flat, the housing benefit covers it. And then they've got their full money every fortnight, 140 quid. They're not down at a tenner a week or 20 quid a week. They're up to 140 quid a fortnight, so 70 quid a week. So. It, it, yeah, it, it, to me, it, what's going on there is is just another example of what you see across so many areas in life, and it is, uh, I can't think of a better phrase than genocide of the poor. Well, that's, the, well that, that, that's an interesting viewpoint because I think at the end of the day, I've said it before, uh, what people don't realise is we are at war and we have been more, we've been at war for a very, very long time in this, this country, in fact, in the world, in the Western world, um, because it's all war, enemy combatant, isn't it? you know, everything that, that you look at, um, it's a financial uh, implication that they're putting in to obviously keep people weighed down so that at the end of the day, in, in theory, clipping our wings so that we don't become all powerful and come together. But we are definitely in a, in a war time within within this, sort of like, you know, the year that we're in now, I mean, 2016. I mean, we're looking at it since we changed from the 90s, which I think were quite, quite 80s, 90s were very good for a lot of people. The minute we come into the noughties as the class, which is 2000, uh, a lot of things started changing. Uh, and if we look at it from a, a numerological point of view, uh, 10 in, in numerology, I keep spouting on about is X, which is X marks the spot. It's Roman numeral for 10, which we know that a lot of things uh, all go back to Rome, all roads lead to Rome, and it's the Vatican and all that type of thing that's in control. Um, if we look at what 20 means, it's XX, yeah, which is double crossed. And we're all in a position where we're all now in a, in a play where we're getting double crossed now by every facet that's within government, that's within corporations, that's within councils. They're all pissing in the same pot and it's all there to corrupt us, the people, and the people aren't doing anything about it. Mm -hmm. what, what absolutely what? astounded me, I mean, uh, we mentioned when you first came on about the great work you're doing with the the street kitchens in Leeds and in other areas, but um, you, you got them walking up demanding money the other day, didn't you? Um, if you could tell us <laughs> a bit about that. I mean, that is a... a right, a, yeah. What, what's, what's happened is Sunday pretty much we're left alone. It just seems to be on the Monday, which is ironic because it's a moon day, which is Saturn fucking worship as per usual. But on moon day, which is Hayden and, and, and the firm Hayden, Pat, Lisa, Holmes, um, and, and, and all the other guys, 
the police turned up and the first thing that they did is they walked over and took cans off anybody that were drinking because obviously there's legislation you can't drink on the street so or in a public area uh, i can't remember when that law came out but it wasn't so long ago i think it was about three only three or four maybe five years ago and the first thing that's happened is this inspector has come up and he's grabbed the can poured, poured the beer out and he was staring at where we were set up so lisa's gone over and had a cop sort of like interacted and you know is it the mess that you've come for that the waste because we're, we're talking with Leeds city council about the waste and they won't come and pick the waste up What's come from there is obviously we've got into a, a conversation with the inspector and what's come out is that Leeds City Council are wanting £850 rent for Leeds City Square, uh, Leeds City Square uh, to which I turned around and said, I'm sorry, but can you go back to Leeds City Council and tell them that this is our land, we're the people and we own it and they're just the stewards? Yeah. So therefore, there'll be no billing place and there'll be no charging place. To which he looked at me and said, they'll come and bill you anyway. And I said, well, if they're going to come and bill us, that's not an issue because we'll bill them right back £1,850 because we're doing what they should be doing and they're not doing what they're doing, what we're doing. And we're the people and we're putting our hands in our pockets and feeding these people that are in a vulnerable state and a vulnerable situation and we're making sure they're getting a hot meal. And if Leeds City Council have got anything that they want to say, they're more than welcome to come and speak to us. And they can't, you can't be in a position where they're sending you down as their spokesperson when you don't work for Leeds City Council. And, you know, and not just that, at the end of the day, you're acting as a private militia right now. Uh, and he looked at me very, very strange, you know, because he didn't sort of like comprehend what I was saying to him at first, because he kept reading, re, re, you know, saying, well, they, they will bill you. I said, well, they won't bill us because there's nobody to bill with the people. We're not a company. We're not registered. So therefore, they've got no contract. They've got no angle that they can come down, you know, and bill us. Yeah. Yeah, well yeah, done yeah. there, Toddy. I think they needed to be put in their place there. Um, as with as so many of these officials, they did, you know, they, we've all of a good a sudden gone what well, not suddenly but we we've transitioned from a a, pl a place where th there used to be a thing called public service you know people went into public service now they're going into power and authority and it's all bloody wrong it's all asked about face we're the people with the power and the authority we've just given it away well, it seems to me exactly what you're saying there is at the end of the day, it's the corporations are becoming the ruling sort of like force on this planet. Now, that to me is something that's dead, that is telling the living how to live their life. Yeah. Now, we are, as you probably were aware, and a lot of people who are listening tonight are aware, we are actually classed as dead entities anyway as well. Therefore, at the end of the day, we're taking orders, allegedly, from corporate that are dead because we're seen as dead as well but the point is we're not dead we know we're not dead but we've been entrapped into this system through obviously mum and dad going and signing the birth certificate which is then realistically speaking that is our birth and death registration yeah so therefore we were born but then it was transferred to birth you run off with ticket gone down the dangle the carrot the carrot is basically you can you can you know claim for child benefit, child tax credit, and that's why a lot of people are entrapped into the system because they've dangled that money at them. Uh, so yeah, pretty much the corporations are, and they think they're the ruling force on the planet, which at the end of day is nighttime rule. So it all goes back to uh, Horace, which is the sun, the hours of the day, and it's all to do with Horace and Set, isn't it? And unfortunately, we're in a position where Set is ruling at the minute. This is pretty much big time, big, big, big time where the uh, you know the sun's being blocked out with the old chemtrails and stuff like that, because they're actually weaponising the sun now because a lot of people are getting skin cancer and stuff. Um, so they're using the uh, the sun, the giver of life, as a weapon. <laughs> but that's getting a little bit off beaten track. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> tad, tad. Just a tad. Let's get back to the uh, less fortunate, the homeless, the uh, people that are in a position of, uh, you know, that need our help. We go down, we've got some absolutely fantastic people that are around us that come in and they're putting, you know, every week they turn up, they're giving us the time. 
their energy and it's all for free. Uh, going back to the police officers that were, that were there, they were there a good hour and a half. Um, now Hayden obviously has dealt with them and spoke with them and, and he, he, he were really, really, really kicking off with them saying, listen, you're going around giving yellow cards, red cards out and moves, move, moving people off the street. So these people that have been given yellow cards and red cards through the day could not come and access the street kitchen that we've put on on a Sunday or a Monday yeah, because yeah. they're banned from the streets of Leeds. Um, so Hayden's got a big hang up with that. Um, Hayden's really the guy that needs to speak about that because he's really in tune with what's going on with that. Uh, but that's pretty much what they're doing. So um, they're also coming out with the you know all these adverts um, that, that, that are stating don't give a beggar any money. Your money's going up in smoke, that kind of thing. Yeah, that was happening in Nottingham, weren't it? It was. It's happening in Nottingham. If Leeds, but Leeds uh, bus station, there's one up there. I read a little article on it the other day. There's another group of people called Simon on the Streets. They dig through Leeds, but they don't have a kitchen. They just go out with the flasks and bags of sandwiches and things like that. And uh, they're in a position where that they've put a campaign against the ridiculing people that are begging. I mean, even this inspector were going on about the begging situation, that he didn't agree with it because people are professionally doing it, he's saying, and, and they're getting 500 quid a week, 100 pound a day, some of these beggars. Uh, and he sort of like went down the line of, I work, uh, I've got to work all these hours and when I finish my hours, uh, you know, I'll pay me tax and this, that and other. And I looked at him and I said straight away, and I said, and that is what the problem is. You're working all these hours. You chose to do this job. This guy's begging. You're not happy that he's not he's paying his fair of tax and HMRC aren't getting their money out of it. This is what this is about. It's about looking after corporations again. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's the old, the old, um, uh, the old, the old analogy. analogy. Someone's getting beaten up. Everybody's getting beaten up. And the one guy that isn't getting beaten up, um, the, 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 everyone that is getting beaten up is mad at him rather than the person that's beating him up. Yeah, well, pretty much that's exactly what it is. And it's, it's massive level programming, isn't it? You know, let's let's look at the bigger picture. Oh, it's all programming. These people that are in positions of authority or alleged authority, which obviously the inspector won't happen when I turn around and said to him, you know, if I, if we stripped your uniform back, you're just like me and, me, me and this guy next to me, and they were the same. And he looked at me like confused. And it was like, are you that deep, deeply programmed? that you think when you're at that uniform that you have some authority over ourselves. You haven't. We've got no authority over anybody. Yeah. And they, they, they can't get it. I don't think they can get a grip, grip of it. But, you know, we had we had, we had quite a few conversations. There's, there's a meeting set up with Leeds City Council in the next week or two, um, which is something that we set up that evening when these two, two uh, officers of the law were there. Or should, as we pointed it out, because it was quite funny. Because in Leeds City Square, you've got you've got the Black Prince on his horse, and you've also got John Harrison. He's another statue. And I turned around, I said, you know, when they were going on about these legislations, and I just I pointed him out and went, look at that statue there. It's not moving. And they were looking, and they're like, they, they didn't have a clue what I was getting at. You know, because it's statutes and acts that you're quoting. But your statutes and acts don't uh, rule over the living and where the living. That's you know a good I mean? analogy, really, because with statutes and acts, statutes don't move, but you have to move towards them, and that's like giving you consent. Absolutely, there you go. So therefore, they say name. As soon as they ask you your name, that's what they go off with. Because as soon yeah, as that yeah. name's, as soon as that name's announced, they've got something to look for on their system, and if they find that name then they can then start prosecuting, persecuting, because it's more persecution than prosecution. It's persecution of the soul, isn't it? It is. It is. And, and what also, it's it's a bit of a double whammy as well, because not only are they persecuting the homeless, and, and the, the, we should all agree that in this day and age, there shouldn't be a single homeless person in this country. No matter where they come from, they, they should, there shouldn't be a single homeless person in this country. Um but they're also persecuting the people that are trying to help them. So it, it's it's as if they don't want these people help. They want them to stay where they are and and, and to and to be persecuted more and more and more. It's 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 like a never-ending system. It's a never-ending machine that that just won't stop. 
Well, absolutely, I, I fully agree. But the thing, let's look at the big picture. We are we're being run by nighttime. It's nighttime rule that's the, the, that's ruling. It's the ruling force of. I mean, if we strip it all down, it's up Saturn worship, which is nighttime. We use money, which is moon eye, which is obviously the moon. It comes out on a night time. Everything's to do with night time. And at the end of the day, everything's dead. Therefore, the persecution will keep happening until we step into the light and move into the, the light rather than the night time. And people are slowly stepping out of, out of the dark into the light. And this is what people are coming up against, which is you guys, myself, 90% of the listeners on your show, they are stepping into the light and we're realising what is actually going on, that it's a nighttime grip, it's the death grip, which is like your mortgage and all that type of stuff. Yeah, because mortgage, morg, you know, where do the dead go? Well, when they die, we take them to the morgue, don't we? Do you know what I mean? Well, it's all mort, mort is Latin for dead. Uh, absolutely. This is why end of day you go to a mortuary. <laughs> you know what I mean? So you know, it, you know, the house basically that you live in is that's that's the mort that that is a mortuary. Mm-hmm. As, as mad as that sounds. But that's exactly right, because you've got a mortgage that's attached to the house if you are a, a legal owner or, you know, finding out a legal tenant because you're actually a tenant paperwork and not the owner. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's what we're seeing. See, it's just, it's, it's absolutely crazy. And these people are that um, dragged in and, and live in this system like the people that think they've got this authority, you know, these superpowers, uh, which they haven't got. Because like the only people with superpowers that I know are Superman and Spider Man, and I keep saying this to people, you know. And as far as I'm concerned, they are fictional characters. They are fictional characters. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that's what everything is. Not really, everyone's really a fictional character. All these people that are um, like but before us. I understand what you're saying. Um, we're in an age where darkness seems to have got the upper hand, um, and the powers of the darkness. If you you know if you want to call it that, um, I've got the upper hand. But do, do you see that? Do you see things changing? Do you see? I mean, you're down down there on the streets. What what's the attitudes of people walking past? I mean, have, are they interested in what you're doing? And, I, I, and how do they res, res, how do they respond to the homeless people? We have we have had a lot of people come over and commend everybody that, that is doing what they do. I mean, there's a chap called John. He's coming down this Sunday every fortnight. Um, he came from visits his brother over in Huddersfield, and he came up and he spoke to us a couple of weeks back, and he just says, look, this is absolutely fantastic what you're doing in every day, you know, and he's given us a fiver. Now, that fiver, Hayden had come down and helped us on, on this Sunday, and he went and got the milk and coffee. And when this guy gave us this fiver, I went straight up, to head and went, there you go, mate, that's your money back. They went, you sure? I went, absolutely, yeah, because you've just come down out to us. This guy's given us a fiver donated, and I'll give it straight to him. So we've got people that actually come over and do give cash donations, but what we do with that is we document it, take an email from them, and we update them what that money's gone on. Cool. Okay? But the way that people do, they come up and they are engaging and speaking to some of the homeless, and, you know, they are, they are part, taking part and, 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 you know, finding out stories from the homeless people and some that are in the, you know, the hostels and finding out how they got there, what was it that turned their life upside down to put them in the position that they're in. And people are engaging. And it's really good because at the end of the day, people keep coming on and, you know, they'll drop a bag of clothes or they'll come over and say, this is not time here. To- Can you put that towards next week? And it's absolutely fantastic. So people... Do without speaking with us, obviously members that are actually turning up and out, getting the food that we're putting on, um, and it is quite positive, um, you know. But then we do have the bad nights like this Monday night that's just gone. Um, you know, a lot of Sunday somehow that turned up with bottles of something that turned up with all sorts, and it's like somebody sabotaging that night on a Monday. Because the week prior we had the coppers turn up, and this week what we've had is we've had there were half of them were half pissed before we'd even set up to you know start serving the food. 
So right. it's like somebody's coming in and sabotaging. Yeah, but I, it, it's good that you're getting some acknowledgement from people that... Uh, oh, um, sorry, I was just reading some on, on the chat. Yeah, it's good that people are acknowledging what you're doing. And, and um, what about all? What about the other people? What, I, give, give a bit of a shout out and, uh, to the other people that that, um, that are going along, that are involved in, in, in this project. Right, well, the, uh, the, the, which probably a lot of people are aware of, they might have heard before, because myself and Lou Meg were obviously, uh, we, we were on one of your chats, I think it was episode 33, ironically, or something like that. <laughs> Meg, she comes up, she does all the food, she cooks all the main meals and cakes and all sorts, she comes up. So, big shout out to her, because at the end of the day, she's unique. There's nobody out there like her at this minute in time. Uh, up in Leeds that can can step up to the plate like she does. Then we've got uh, Lee Stead. Lee Stead comes, he fetches uh, the uh, tables, he fetches the gazebo. Um, he's got a little van that's invaluable because that allows us to obviously put up and set up our little uh, you know pitch. Um, you've got Dell. He comes down uh, every week. He stands and he does a little bit of security. He does Dell. It's quite funny. He holds everybody in the queue because we. We've had to start getting them to queue up in a lab away from the setup to allow we get everything set up because otherwise it's hands and feet everywhere and you don't know where you are and it's a million miles an hour. So he steps up and uh, he holds them all in line. Uh, then we've got Jo, jo Sharp. She comes from Huddersfield. She's absolutely fantastic. She goes out and she goes on an outreach where we take bags with sandwiches in, uh, buns, cakes, crisps, breakfast bars, fruit, bottles of water. They'll go out on an outreach and go around town and find people that are actually sat in doorways and things like that. And she actually sits and speaks with them and, and comforts them and stuff. They absolutely love her. Um, we've got other people that come down. We've got, like I said, Lee Thomas Partnership. They, they come down and they help us on a Sunday. That's Hayden Pat, Lee Soames, uh, Dawn Hay. Um, th th there's quite a lot of people that are coming down from there as well that are coming in and helping. A chap called Ian, he jumps behind. Um, so we've got quite a, quite a connectivity going on between two groups that are working hand in hand now. Uh, the, we've both got our own individual nights. Uh, we've got Jason that comes down. As a lot of people know Jason Nota, a uh, real change. He comes down and uh, he, he, he jumps in. He's doing a lot of interviewing and things like that at the minute with people that are in a, a less fortunate situation than ourselves. So we've got quite a lot of footage that's getting put together. And there's going to be a mini video coming out later on down the line, which gives people more of an insight of like a guide where, where how people have become in the situation that they've come in. Um, and much sort of like, you know, touching the surface of obviously the people that are involved. Uh, we've got other people come like Shane Joy, he fetches donuts every week, believe it or not, donuts and, you know, little cakes and stuff. Um, so we've got quite a good thing going on with the people that, 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 that are involved. We've also got people sat in the background that are actually donating now. Uh, they're donating things like um, uh, tables. We've got two new tables that are coming this week. We've got um, a little cooking stove that's coming with two hobs on it. So now we need to get the money together to buy a gas ball. At the minute, Leeds Homeless Partnership are giving us their gas ball and their stove to warm the food up. So somebody's donated us a stove this week um, that's probably cost them about 25 quid. Uh, that's a lady called uh, Meg Selby, if anybody knows her. Um, she's donated that. Um, she sits in the background and she 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 helps. I mean, also she's donated 15 quid, which is going to get enough weight to put into the foods and things like that, you know, and, and, and like containers. Uh, there's so much goes into what, what goes on. If people actually came down and looked at what happened, it's massive. There's so much that we need. Napkins, socks, plates, knives, forks, spoons, containers, deodorants, um, you know, toothpaste, toothbrushes. These all come with a cost and we're not actually getting these given. What we get is we get, you know, uh, boxes from Morrison's. They come and what comes in them boxes we then utilise. They will not give us meat. So we've actually got to purchase to make the, the meals. Um, at the moment, currently, it's a hundred pound a week that we're spending, yeah, out of our own pockets to run this street kitchen, and that goes on a variety of things. So we've what we've done is we've set up a GoFundMe page through the street kitchen, 
uh, purely and simply, if people want to donate, we will then let you know where that money is going. Um, because we can't always we can't always meet that as to put in. A lot of the people that are coming down are in a position where at the end of the day they can donate their time and their energy. So I lever then because it's, it's like I said, it's costing hundred pound a week. I do know obviously we've only been going like six weeks, but we're Leeds Homeless Partnership. They're in a position now where they're spending between two and three hundred pound a week out of their own pockets running theirs because they don't just do the Monday night and then an outreach. They actually go out on a Tuesday night and do an outreach. And sometimes they go out on a Thursday night and do an outreach as well, which is going out, like I say, with the bags, with the flasks and everything else. So they're, they're bordering two, three hundred pounds a week that they're spending. Um, and that money comes through, through donations. It comes through the sponsorship. Obviously, at the end of the day, we're doing the sponsorship, which is the uh, sleep out on the 4th of June, which is at Hyde Park. Uh, the money that gets raised from that will go back into the kitchens and will be utilised for things like sleeping bags, uh, ground sheets, tents, socks, boxer shorts, knickers, because these are things that fundamentally, as we've gone before, with people that are on benefits, can't afford clothes. And especially if they're in a position where they're in hostels and things like that, they, they don't want to wear second-hand knickers and second-hand boxer shorts and stuff. So them type of things need to be there because they're, they're a necessity. And it makes them feel better when they've got clean underwear and clean socks on. I know you guys, you guys will probably be, obviously everybody will be probably in agreement that when you use boxer shorts and put fresh ones on and, and fresh knickers, if you're into that type of thing, uh, as a bloke, uh, but definitely for the ladies, uh, but socks as well, you know, you, you feel fresh when you've got these things on. And these things cost money and they're not cheap. And we do need to go out and buy them. So the donations that are coming in will be utilised in them areas uh, for deodorants that I don't agree on because of the chemicals that are in them. But these guys want them. They want the soaps. They want the shower gels. They want the deodorants. They want all these things. Um, and we are trying our best to get that together now. Whereas Leeds Homeless Partnership are in the position where they've got that weekly we're not we're not in a position where we've got towels for them, clean towels and boxes and socks and, and things like that. So it's things that we're learning along the way with working in, in, in you know in, in conjunction with Lee Thomas partnership. We've not got all this stuff, but we're getting there slowly. Um so pretty much I mean that's that, that, that that's where we are at the minute. And it's uh, the, the food that we're putting on, absolutely, you know, it's 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 phenomenal. The people come up and they're like, this food is absolutely fantastic. It's better than restaurant food when Lou Meg makes it, I'm telling you. Oh, mate, oh. I've seen the pictures of what Lou posts on Facebook of, of what she makes for people. And it, I'll be quite honest, um, I get the bunches as soon as I've looked at Lou's, Lou's page on Facebook. It looks absolutely fabulous. It, it's it's un smart and low of the passion that goes into cooking that food by that lady is unbelievable and when she turns up we get all set up she goes and stands in her place and she commands serving that food that hot food just to see the look in the eyes of the people that she's giving it to and that's her payment she absolutely that is what it's about and and she makes homemade cakes and i mean last week we had chocolate cake with custard upside down pineapple cake with custard that we'll put in the containers now the plastic containers that you probably get from chinese takeaways people might be sort of like you know have an idea of what i'm talking about here they don't come cheap they come with a cost and we're having to pay for them you know they're not cheap at all i think it's 250 for like a, a tenner or something like that i don't know the true cost mm -hmm. because lou's dealing with that and brett's almost dealing with the cost side of things so we're not over the month's time because that's when we're going to release exactly what what it's cost us within a four-week turnaround and what the money's gone on but they're not cheap things, and the donations go on this stuff because when they've had a hot meal and they come round and they collect a bag that's got sandwiches in, so we're, we're, we, we go through about 100 sandwiches on a, on, 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 a, on a Sunday, so we've got to put 100 sandwiches together. And in that respect, <clears throat> you've got people that are coming down that don't eat meat, which you've already touched on, so they'll have cheese and onion or they'll have cheese and tomato or something like that. <clears throat> but the sandwiches, the sandwich fillings, We've got to go out and buy because the supermarkets won't give us cheese and uh, tuna and, uh, you know, beef and ham or whatever it would be. 
<coughs> you know, that stupid motorbike gear. Hang on. Can you hear it? That's a little motorbike. Can you listen? <laughs> oh, yeah. Who's having That's a what I have to put up with. in a crossbow, Jay. Oh, absolutely terrible. <laughs> hey, Tony, I wanted to... Um, the worst thing I wanted to ask you... Um, uh, you you also get uh, local businesses, don't you, that that donate food. I, I saw you a photo of you next to some pizzas. I seem to remember putting a rather witty comment in the uh, comments on Facebook. I stole one of them slices and I feel really, really guilty. Uh, I, did, you, I, did, I couldn't help but just try it because I wanted to they were, and honestly, they were to die for. Yeah, local businesses, we've got... Um, a local business in Headingley, which is just up the road from Hyde Park, which is called Echo Pizzeria, uh, Pizzeria whatever it's called, yeah. They donate every fortnight, and they, I think they donate five boxes, which is 12-inch pizzas, yeah. We've got a curry um, house, which is up in Driglinton. They're called Prashard. Uh, Gordon, God, is it Gordon Ramsay? Gordon Ramsay signed them off. So that's how high quality they are. They donate curry, vegetable curry and rice, every second Sunday as well. So we've got them on board. I'm speaking at the moment with a, a Leeds-based bakery called Gilchrist's. That if you're from Leeds, you probably probably know who they are. Um, I'm waiting for them to get back to me because I've asked them if they would donate us weekly on a Saturday 100 bread cakes, which then gives us the option of making, you know, the sandwiches, which takes uh, it out of our pockets and we're not having to buy it out of our pockets. And it's another company that we can actually promote through the Real Change, Real Change Street Kitchen page. Therefore, it's free advertising for them, and it gets them known that they're a contributor as well. So the two that we've got at the minute is, is Echo Pizza. Uh, that's in Headingley on Otley Old Road. And we've got the one up in Driglington, which is the Curry House, uh, which is Prashard's. And they're the two that are involved at the minute. The supermarket, the main one at the moment, as we well know, is Morrison's. Uh, and they're doing us absolute. They give us fruit, they give us veg, uh, they give us all sorts, breakfast, bars, you name it, bars of chocolate, crisps, all sorts comes. And that really, really does pack up the outreach bags that we that we put put together. Because like I say, they have a hot meal and they go away with a bag. Uh, we purchase the water, we've got to go buy the bottles of water. Um, so there's nobody donating water as yet. This is coming out of our pockets too. But believe it or not, we go through like 20 quid's worth of water a week. Yeah, and that's and the, the water's really quite cheap as well, isn't it? I mean, you can go to um, buy bottled water in Morrison's, for example, if you want to support the people that are helping by donating food. You can go in and, and, and buy in Morrison's. So sort of like, I think you can get eight four litre bottles for, for like two quid or something. Well, the, the, this is it. I mean, it depends obviously on what water you want. And, you know, we don't give up, we don't give out Perrier, but the amount of bottles that we do go through um, goes into the bags and then they come back for a second bottle sometimes and stuff, you know. So at the end of the day, if we're getting on average, we're getting about 70 people a week coming, but then it's hard to sort of like number the amount of people because what's happening is, we get them coming in waves. So when people go, on, when we get people going on the outreach, like Lee Stead and Joanne, they go out and find people in town. There's people in town that are not sat in doorways that actually just walk past and they say, end of day, are you homeless too? Yeah, where are you? Get yourself down to City Square. So they end up coming down to City Square and getting fed as well. Uh, but we are going yeah. uh, currently through around about 100 bottles of water a week. Um, I know that Leeds Homeless Partnership are going through pretty much so I like double that. Um, so there's a lot of water going. Um, we, we, we obviously provide hot drinks as well, tea, coffee, uh, hot chocolate and things like that. So when they've got a meal, they come through, they get the pick up, obviously the bag and what have you, they pick some crisps up or other things that are obviously on the tables and they'll come to the end and they'll, they'll, they'll go through coffee. So we've got to buy the pot of styrene cups. We've got to buy the sugar. We've got to buy the milk. We've got to buy the coffee. We've got to buy the tea. We've got to buy the hot chocolate. We're having to okay, buy okay. Uh, Toddy, uh, give us a, a definitive place where people can donate so that we're clear that anybody that wants to donate, anybody who wants to help, whether it's socks or cups or, or you know, if they've, got, if they've got a business and they've got a few spare things that they might have, the catering thing that they can donate or anything like that, tell us where the best place is to go 
and and be able to to you know find out more and, and to donate some things. Right. So no, fantastic. Right. You can come to Real Change Street Kitchens, which is obviously on Fair, but which is our main page. You can put a post on there, or you can come direct to me, which is Paul Todd. If you've got me on Facebook already or what have you, you can come direct there to me, send me an inbox. Um, you can also Google the, the Real Change Street Kitchen page, and there's a GoFundMe account being set up, which we keep posting. So if people want to actually donate money, that money then, like I say, will be transpired where we will give a feedback every month of where the money's been, where the money's being put, what it's been spent on, so people know ex- exactly where that money's going. Uh, but the main page is the Real Change Street Kitchen page for people to get in touch, or like myself, um, and that pretty much covers it. If they're a, if they're a business or they've got clothes, uh, which clothes are a good thing to obviously send to us because we do need them. We've got people that are in the same clothes, jeans, t-shirts, jumpers, that do require this kind of thing. Um, the best way to deal with it is if you've got an accumulation of clothes, get hold of me, and what we'll do is we'll arrange to come and pick it up. Now, we are needs based, so pretty much within our limits, um, it would have to be within the Leeds and the Yorkshire area, but we've got people stationed, and at the minute we've got people stationed in Huddersfield, we've got people stationed in Bradford, Leeds, Wakefield. So within them areas, we, we, we can arrange to get clothes and things picked up, and then obviously it gets brought to us at Leeds. So we can go with it, and we can put out what needs to be put out. It's left over. What we do is we then pass it into Leeds Homeless Partnership, and they do the same thing with us as well. They come and help us with clothes. We help them with clothes. Whatever we've got left over with food, that gets pushed onto them as well onto a Monday if there's anything left over. But pretty much to answer your question, Real Change Street Kitchen on Facebook, get on there, add yourself as a member, keep an eye on what we're doing, watch out for the GoFundMe page if you want to donate money, watch out you know, for anything else that's coming up. If you want to donate quantities of food, not a problem, we can do that because we are looking at supporting um, the hostels as well, which on Monday, the food that was left over on a Monday night, which was chilli con carne, myself, from Leeds Homeless Partnership went up to a place just on Gelded Road there, which is Bracken Court, and we went there and we donated the food that we had left over, and they took it with open arms. They were like that, absolutely fantastic. They got buns, cakes, crisps, and chilli con carne and rice, and they dished that out on an evening to the people that were in the hostels there free of charge, of course. That's pretty amazing, Toddy. You're doing absolutely sterling work, you, Lou, and all your helpers there. Um, we've just got a couple of minutes left now, um, so we need to give a shout out for the Real Change Leeds events that's coming up. And I know you've got a new venue, you're really excited about that. So if you could just uh, give us a brief outline of what's going off there, mate. Right, okay, on the 11th of June, which is a Saturday, we're kicking off at 12 o'clock till 5 o'clock. It may overlap, because it normally does do, because people want to stop around after their meetings. Uh, we, we're into a new venue, because the old venue, uh, there were a lot of trouble. It was a nightclub, as you probably, uh, yourself, Andy and Jay know, you've been to the venue. Yeah. Uh, it's a nightclub on a night time, and it's obviously it's open through a day. There's been a hell of a lot of trouble. I don't think they, they've been given their licence, so... They've lost the license on that, which has then put us in a position where we can't use the venue either because they can't serve alcohol and things like that. Uh, we got that venue for free. The new venue we've got uh, is down on Tong Road. It's uh, 67. I'm going to have to check the bloody address now. <laughs> you caught me out. It's, uh, it's the... Um, the it's White the Rose Bank of Gene Suite. Yeah. You know it better than I do. I only know it because I wrote it down when you told me earlier. It's yeah, sacred. and it slips my mind every time because it's a new venue. Yeah, we're at, um, we're, we're obviously, it's, it's the new venue. It's on Tong Road, um, and it's called the White Rose Banqueting Suite, uh, and it's disabled-friendly. There's a ramp up to it. There's disabled facilities toilets, so if anybody has a disability or anything like that, uh, we're in a position where we can say, yes, come now, because we've had situations before where people couldn't. Uh, we start at 12 o'clock. Uh, when we get that kicked in, we've got Ian Ron Crane coming up. He's talking about the EU, EU referendum. Uh, he's also talking a little bit about the fracking, because obviously, as people are aware, um, York, uh, or should I say North Yorkshire councillors in, uh, is it Alec, North Allerton? 
mm-hmm. they all came together the other week and they've just decided to go against 96% of the vote, which was no fracking, and 4% and say, yeah, we'll do some fracking now because 4% have kicked in. So I think Ian Crane will be touching that for the EU referendum as well. We've got Hayden, Pat and Lou, Meg and myself talking about the Real Change Street Kitchens and the Leeds Homeless Partnership Kitchens. We've got um, a situation where we've got another couple of people because there's um, natural health coming into things now. And so we've got a lady coming up to talk about natural health and there will be a natural health um, real change page coming up soon, but that will have to be after this event. Uh, we've also got, like I say, uh, the Leeds Homeless Partnership. They will be talking about the street kitchens with us, but they will also be talking about the homeless situation and uh, the help that we're trying to put together now because we're not just doing the street kitchens. We're trying to put a package together where we've got um, counsellors on board in respect to people that want mental health uh, I've got mental health issues where we've got proper people involved that deal with that type of thing that they're going to do it for free. We've also got a situation where at the end of the day, uh, we're trying to get obviously landlords on board now where we can get landlords in a position where we can then get people out of the crypt in town and get them into obviously homes with support in respect to obviously drug rehabilitation, drink rehabilitation and things like that. So there's all that that's going to be talked about at the meeting. And we've got another couple of people that we can't announce that will be coming um, because we want that to be a little bit of a surprise for people. We've also got um, a chap called uh, Anthony, Wayne Anthony Abel, or Anthony Wayne Abel, that's the English English Randoms videos. He's coming and he's speaking. Uh, he's talking about social services and the things that have been going on with the family courts in this scenario. Some people might be aware of it. Uh, but it's been pretty much railroaded, and he's coming up and talking about that. So it's going to be a good day. It's going to be full of positive energy, as per usual. And you you felt the energy yourself, Andy and Jay, when you've been up and Lou, um, or should I say Tina? Um, and that's pretty much it. That that's what's happening. That's on Saturday the eleventh. But what we're wanting to do is we're in a position where this is a new venue. We need to fill that venue because it's coming free. It's a it's a trial. They're trialing us. So pretty much it's saying it's a free venue. They've got to start taking on that bar for us to sort of like get that venue on a regular occurrence and to actually pull off and get that kind of venue has took a lot of soul searching. We've looked at so many venues and been knocked back. It's unbelievable. So please, guys, if you're in the vicinity, please drop in and support the real change train because it's obviously it's getting it's getting out there now. And we're doing a lot of positive things. We're affecting a lot of positive people and putting positivity back into positive uh, or back back into people's lives. Speak. Yeah, you're doing an absolutely grand job, and it's a pleasure to know people like you and to to get you on the show to give a shout out for what you're doing, Toddy. And uh, I'll say thank you, a big thank you to you for coming on, and a big thank you to David Halpin. I hope he's found his dog by now. If not, I hope he finds it very shortly. And we'll be back with Rick Simpson on Tuesday. So stay tuned for the doc, folks. You're welcome.